<laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm so excited to see all of you and see so many familiar names in the chat from old life, from new life. And just thank you again for this opportunity to, to share today. I have a bunch of stuff prepared. I probably made too much. So um, I'm going to I'm going to go. <laughs> I'm going to start sharing. And if at any moment something hiccups, you just all you just all tell me, but make sure that you can hear and see this, right? All good, Josh? Yep. Okay, great. Um, hello. I can see some of your thumbnails in the side. Um, I'm just tickled that everybody showed up. And I am, again, so honored to, to be able to share some of my own personal work with you from the last 15 years of working in and around multi-sensory design. So if you don't know me, I'm wearing the same shirt as in this photo look, but I have literally gone through, I think I counted 22 different haircuts in the last 20 years. It's like a haircut a year or more. Um, and I've done a lot of different things, as Josh said, you know, my path has taken me from everything from wedding photography to photo editing. I restored a medieval chateau in France in 2001. I opened five different bars and restaurants in New York City. I have a master's degree in industrial design and a bachelor's degree in screenwriting and contemporary dance. So all of that woven together today makes me a, a creative director, an artist, a mother, a friend, a worker, and most importantly, I'm alive and here today. So thank you again for sharing this space with me. I do wanna just you know, print, put some parentheses around this presentation that all opinions in this presentation are my own. And also that all the stories in here are made with other people. You know, I get the great privilege of being able to sit here on a screen and talk about it, but it's on the shoulders and in participation with so many incredible other artists, creatives, and all the soft labor that goes behind this, not to mention all the people whose shoulders this creativity stands upon as our ancestors. So I want to acknowledge that first and, and then take us on a little, a little whimsical ride. So I've worked over the last 15 years mostly in and out of experience design with a focus on food and multi-sensory experience. I've made everything from a lickable ice cream orchestra and a cotton candy theremin. You'll see a little bit of that today. Dinner in a Jimmy Shoe stiletto, um, the world's first multi-sensory feeling organ and an interactive flavor factory. I've mostly worked in between experiential marketing and cultural institutions, as well as created some of my own inventions along the way. Um, and two main influences that really affected, you know, what I make and also how I make are these two people. As you heard me say, I originally trained in screenwriting and contemporary dance. I had the great honor of being able to train in Martha Graham uh, choreography, which really gave me the understanding that movement could be a vocabulary for human emotion. The way our bodies shift and change in space and with each other can also be a really expressive language and lexicon. And I also, along the way, had an amazing opportunity to work with Chef Will Goldfarb, who, in my opinion, is one of the world's great pastry chefs now located in Bali. And Will, through my work with him in food design, really opened up the landscape of food being a multi-sensory material, actually our only multi-sensory material on earth, because when we eat, we don't just taste, we hear, we smell, we feel, we see. And due to Will and his work in food and creativity, I also learned that this act of the everyday could be a medium and a material for artistic expression and personal storytelling. Now, the relationship of body and, and taste, um, you know, is nothing new. We have to feed ourselves to live. We also feed ourselves for a whole bunch of other reasons. I couldn't help but put this photo in this presentation. <laughs> High five, Jillian. Um, but the relationship between, you know, what we consume and how our body perceives that is fundamental to how I approach experience design. Um, and as you see here, you know, food and smell, for example, have a very direct correlation. And I don't know where you are all sitting today or if you can, but I, should you all have a nose, I would invite you to just do a really quick exercise with me. Um, if you've got any kind of a cup of coffee or a piece of food, you can bring it up to your mouth and very simply plug your nose. I'm going to try it with this amazing headset on. Hopefully my radio voice keeps going. And if you pinch your nose and you just like stick us up. And while you're doing that, keep it really tightly pinched and then you unpinch it. Oh, right. And you can taste. This is a child's trick, child's play. But what it does reveal, and I love to practice this, is that 
our senses really are what I would call our human technology. And for example, without our sense of smell, we have no sense of taste. And that lays a primer for how our senses really, I believe, start to work together as an orchestra of meaning, that they're all working together simultaneously to program how we perceive what we taste. And in experience design at large, that is no different. Our senses work in the same way. So when I say that I work with food, both as medium, but also as metaphor, that's what I mean. Really looking into it as an orchestra that works together to craft our perception and make meaning. And when we start to think about how we choreograph our sensory interactions, we're also therefore starting to think about and explore how we are choreographing meaning and crafting perception in the world at large. Now, this talk um, will take you through a lot of different ways that I've explored that. It is very emergent, you know, it's gonna be a hodgepodge of things that I've loved discovering along these last 15 years. Um, it's gonna be all of my own personal work, as I said before. And throughout this, you know, there'll be some emergent insights because as you see here, I, I really am working on it. These are notes from this presentation. <laughs> um, if there is one thing though, that you take away from this talk is this, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't take it seriously. Not that I'm not a serious person and a good creative, but um, really the point of this slide is to remind us all that judgment is the great killer of creativity. You know, the moment that we start to take anything much too seriously, to not be able to laugh at ourselves, for example, I do believe that we start to block all the possibility and the wonder and the openness that really rich creativity serves us. I learned this along the way. My family is a series of really funny people. I'm the least funny person in all of it. I love to make fun of my baby brother who now gets paid to dress up in pink velour and wear wings. So, you know, bravo Timote. Um, he really is for me the embodiment. <laughs> <laughs> of how humor and play can really be inroads to radical, radical creativity. Um, I also want you to take away from this presentation this, that technology is not here to save us. Here's some mid-journey work that I made for this presentation. And um, I think it speaks, it speaks for itself. So be careful of your words. <laughs> And somehow not scary and very friendly is not something that the algorithm really understands. But speaking of mouths and yellow brick roads and delights, I wanted to start with this project. This is, uh, this is a project that's actually now about 10 years old. And it was the first piece of work that I made that really brought food and technology together to explore how our senses could be vehicles for experience. Um, this project, was made with an incredible artist and collaborator friend of mine, Carla Diana, and a host of other really wonderful people. Carla and I um, had started a residency together at the Visible Futures Lab at the School of Visual Arts, and we wanted to explore our shared love of music, bands, and food. And throughout that process, we did a lot of different prototyping. You know, we stuck sensors in everything edible. I would not recommend putting sensors in bread dough. That was not a successful interaction. But where we did start to find some real gold <laughs> is quite is in the gestural overlaps of how something like singing music in a microphone and, for example, licking ice cream would go together. And this seemed to be quite naturally like really rich fodder um, to um, to work from. Hold on one second. I'm now in charge, so I'm going to admit everybody who's joining. Good. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. Hi, everybody. Hello again. So through these explorations, as we started to explore this crossover, we came up obviously with this idea, which I am going quickly and fast through a chaotic, delicious creative process. So you can see the end result um, of an idea that we could maybe make lickable ice cream microphones. So we went about that. We sketched it. Um, we started to model it in 3D and we created these rapid prototyped ice cream cones inside of which we could place capacitive sensors and a little cup of ice cream in the top. And what that meant is that your tongue became kind of the button for, um, for the interaction. As you licked the ice cream cone, the capacitance would measure the resistance between your tongue and the ice cream and send data that would trigger MIDI um, to a central program and then start 
playing you know a band so each ice cream cone in this scenario is a different instrument um and we worked with the wonderful artist and composer Aaron Dyer who is also in the band Buchan Gase if you know her work it's like really beautiful and textural and quite avant-garde um and so Aaron came back to us with a series of sounds and we ended up selecting this series. I'm gonna play it and, and let you listen to it first. Let me know if you can't hear it. So whenever I share that in a public audience, I always like to look and see faces because the, um, the, oops, hold on a second. There we go. Um, obviously this experience, um, you know, brings up a lot. <laughs> it is both delightful, playful, and really weird to see people looking performatively. And, uh, those are the kinds of experiences that I know that I'm drawn to things that are slightly ambiguous that ask questions of us. But what you can also see here is a small device of multi-sensory design. And along that spectra of choosing, you know, what sound goes with an interaction, these sounds were consciously chosen to be very outside of any semblance of ice cream, of traditional definitions of sweetness, for example. So as a vector, as you pull this in multi-sensory design, it really is in high contrast and high tension to something that we nostalgically think about as sweet. And, and kind of universally cute as, as licking ice cream. So that was an intentional choice to take us really out of the ice cream cone and make us have kind of a more observational and objective view of the experience, but also add some real absurdity to it. Absurdity is one of my favorite genres. You'll also notice that the scenography for this is unique. You know, folks are popping up through gallery pedestals there, this was first performed in a gallery, an all-white gallery, and so the riff here was to kind of play with the notion of what is art, and so to inscribe the participants as busts, you know, as they themselves being the work of art, the performance here being the work of art. So how we could start to extract that and also borrow from the lexicon of the art world, slightly poking fun at it, I will admit. Um, there's also a little insight here that I wanted to share is that what are these people tasting, right? This is an edible experience. Well, no surprise, it's vanilla. <laughs> and that is really important in this project. Why? Because when you ask any kind of participant to do something that is so provocative, that is kind of risque, you know, licking in public does not come easily for everyone. What you want to do is you want to give them one thing at least that is a point of comfort. So the higher risk you create, you have to always continue to balance it. So this might be you know, a little tip here, but keep one thing vanilla, higher risk, more need for comfort. So that experience of balance when we are choreographing again with the senses is really important to keep in mind. And taste obviously being something that is one of our most intimate sensual experiences is a place where we really have to tread lightly. So experiences can remain inclusive and there is access for as many people as possible. This went on. I'm going to speed through this. Um, I got really excited about licking. I wanted to go on tour with the ice cream orchestra. I made instead an evolution of that that was a lickable popsicle microphone that allowed me to take this all, <laughs> all over the world. That was my grand vision. Um, we went to music festival. Here's an example of the lickable popsicle orchestra outside land. Composer and musician said it was the weirdest thing he'd ever done in his life. <laughs> um, you don't need to watch that again. But a, a piece here has to do with experiential typologies. I love bands. I love bands. I love bands not because I like going to rock shows. I love bands because bands are about playing together and listening together. 
And in my mind, those are really good human qualities that I want to see more of in the world. And so when we think about designing for experience, I like to think also about how we're training different behaviors within all of our participants to kind of be, you know, famously be the change that we want to see in the world. Something else that I'm interested is the age old artistic adage of making the invisible visible. One of our greatest challenges as people, I think, is you understanding the invisible, the ephemera that's within us and trying to express that and connect in the world. And so this is a very literal cut and paste of that, of exploring different methodologies and interfaces that are invisible and how do we make those tangible. At one point I was ruminating on this and started to become interested again in the overlap, mostly gestural overlap. You'll see that's a real theme in my work. I think a lot about how our bodies interact in space and how, you know, when you play the theremin, if you know that you're essentially playing an invisible interface that is actually very similar to the gestures that you might use when spinning cotton candy, which is also kind of an invisible interface. You don't see sugar and then suddenly you do. You know, these both have also a quality of magic in them. And I love magic. Um, so this went on and um, I started to develop it as a more formal project by quite literally putting them together to create the world's first cotton candy theremin, which is yes, a cotton candy machine that plays music when you spin it. Um, this project was originally developed with wonderful collaborators, Philip Searzega, Charlie Whitney, Ant Food Studios, Smooth Technology, a whole host of folks. And the original iteration of it was a, um, as you see here, a cotton candy machine that's flanked by a ring of infrared sensors. So as you spin, you're triggering spatialized audio as well as affecting a real-time generative sugar crystal landscape in the background that changes from sugar crystals to strands of cotton candy. The idea here was like, could you be in the cotton candy? Could you experience it? Could you shift perception? So all of this was a lot of, a lot of layering um, and really fun to prototype. And it continued to evolve over the years. We got the opportunity to perform it at the Panorama Music Festival um, in New York City. Uh, years ago. And in doing so, we are able to put the cotton candy machine in the center of the 72 foot immersive dome. And so here, as you spin cotton candy, and I'll speak a little bit over this one, um, you start to become the center of a pretty monumental performance. Here, the Panorama Dome was um, sponsored by Hewlett Packard. And the cotton candy machine became like the central performer and as guests were spinning cotton candy, they were able to generate visually dynamic audio, again, a, a sugar crystal universe. There's also something within this that I think is another experience of the site, is that not only are you transforming cotton candy, you're also learning. For anyone who actually is a real piece of it. Not, not so easy as it was. Um, now, what that did was a real discovery as well, because the ability of a single individual to control an entire immersive space was not only novel, but it also was a way to start amplifying an individual experience into a group experience. And I think that's something that sound in this experience actually was the main actor. We had 16 channels of spatialized audio around the space, which is you know, a very vibratory experience for lack of a better word. But it, what it did is it allowed a group of people, this dome could fit about 200 people, to connect to gesture to an individual experience. And the sound design itself, which was created by Ant Food Studios is really silly, it's funny, it's a sugar wrap. I rapped on it, we all rapped on it. We had a great time doing it. But that also contributed and kind of amplified the flavor experience in this silly, like slightly provocative way. And so here's a way that senses can also be used to amplify individual experience without necessarily having everyone do it. It really becomes a moment of magnifying and connecting the me, I think, to the us, which is also a primary interest, as you heard before. Um, and I don't think it's just my interest, you know, throughout time, we've been wondering about these things. We're also very much implicated in that right now in time and place. And I want to acknowledge that as a global context. And we can look back to some of the great dystopian writers, um, you know, 
Brave New World by Aldous Huxley is is one I think of those cautionary tales specifically you know through the American centric lens of how technology and experience might render us in this story like unfeeling right succumbing to all the pleasures of life and no longer going through the difficult experiences and the difficult feelings of being human so at the time I was reading this and I was totally into my <laughs> orchestra and band and instrument typologies. And something struck me within this, if you've ever read this book, is that Huxley describes a scent organ. And the scent organ is there to play arpeggios of thyme, lavender, pig dung, you know, to give participants who are under the soma feeling again. And so I thought, well, we should make it. No one's ever made it. So I went down this path starting to remake Huxley's scent organ. Um, it was installed at the Panorama Music Festival also originally, as you can see, I have a long standing relationship with that wonderful festival that no longer works. It also has gone on now to be permanently installed at Liberty Science Center. And I saw that, that you're here also. So hello and thank you so much for this awesome opportunity. I'm gonna talk through its original instantiation at Panorama. Um, and as you can see here, it's this large scale sculpture that has this collage of horns on it, as well as those little lines underneath our bicycle pumps. And the way that this interactive musical instrument works is that it's designed around a, uh, a wheel of human feeling from happiness all the way to disgust. Each station, when you pump it, triggers sound, light, and smell that is correlated to that specific human emotion. I worked to develop this again with Ant Food Studios who had algorithms around emotional sonic experience and Givaudon, a fragrance and flavor house that also has deep research and algorithmic data based on what sense can elicit what human emotions. So it was a really interesting development process also in the art and science of feeling, um, which has a whole presentation unto itself at some point. Now. What's interesting about this project is that you go around it and these amazing collaged horns are actually naturally the amplifiers for the experience. The way that it works technically is that you pump the bicycle pumps. They are connected to paint gun canisters within which have custom made air fresheners, pressure sensors, and that airflow triggers again, a MIDI soundtrack that is actually then amplified naturally through the horns because the horns are connected to talk boxes. If you know Peter Frampton, there are tubes that connect to mouth, so your mouth like becomes a whammy pedal. So it's a very analog kind of um, human-centric development process. And as you go around, people, as you see here, are playing and bopping, and they're all attempting to play this instrument in concert. Um, I'll play it again just for a quick, brief look at it. I don't know if you see it here, but at some point, if we all play it together, we actually release this giant puff of, of smoke in the middle of it. So there's an Easter egg that's revealed if our emotions, quote unquote, can all be in harmony. That rarely happens, just like in real life. <laughs> but what does happen with this project, which is I think the beautiful consequence and actually the intention of it, is that after the fact, what you see is all of these people walking around, talking to each other and asking, do you think that's what hope is? What does respect smell like to you? is this disgust? It became a vehicle for talking about feelings. And so within that negative space, that's something that I'm, I'm really interested in. That how can we create more places to feel? How can we show, not tell, and kind of create a space to be able to share together the ephemeral bizarre, conflicting, and highly subjective quality of how we see and feel the world as people. Within that, as I said, with this project, there's a huge amount, obviously, of science that we're just at the beginning of understanding. Oliver Sacks is one of my great favorite neuroscientists who famously said, you know, we are not given the world, we make our world. And when we start to explore multisensory design, I don't think that we can ignore kind of the philosophical and the relational aspects of what it means to construct human perception. And we also have to recognize our own individual lens and biases. And I think the more that we start to shed light onto that, that we realize that this actually is a creative act. I think we also start to be able to parse out that the creative act is an essential part of world building, of how, again, we're crafting perception and making meaning 
and making our own realities. And so I think this is a small insight here that as we go into what we're now calling, you know, immersive futures, I think we really also have to parallelly examine how creative actions and creative activities are oftentimes the inroads into building our fantastic realities as well as our individual realities. This is a project that I installed in Chicago just at the end of the pandemic at the Chicago Color Factory. And it plays with this idea in a very simplistic, you know, general public accessible way. But I wanted to introduce this topic that how we see the world might be just our way. And maybe how we talk about that together could be a way together for us. So Flavorama is, uh, I quote, a mini movie theater for the mouth. Um, it's designed within kind of these retro nostalgic tropes of like classic old school movie theaters. And the way that it works is that you're invited upon that entry booth to walk in, gather up a popcorn bucket that has inside of it a viewfinder and five little packets of monochromatic candies, specifically Pop Rocks. And you go into this sort of long, almost runway-like um, room and you sit down and you start to taste, let's see, I want to click, um, and you're prompted to taste each of the different packets. Inside of them, all the Pop Rocks are white. And it asks you, what color are you tasting? And the idea here is that you um, are tasting, but also comparing that to a series of different colored shapes that are within your viewfinder. Again, all very analog, all hearkening back to kind of retro nostalgia um, design vocabulary to make us think about how analog actually our perceptual experiences are. And as you're looking through them, you click through a series of stereoscopic images that ask you to choose if what you're tasting is yellow or blue or red or brown, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are only five flavors. As you see here, there are seven colors. So it's really meant to scramble your brain. <laughs> but really what it's meant to do is again, promote dialogue. Because again, the consequence of this action, which I designed backwards from, was to get people talking to each other. What do you, what color do you think this is? Oh, I think it's purple. Oh, interesting. I think it's yellow. Oh, that kind of dialogic experience where we're in communication with each other about our different perspectives, we're playing with it, and we're also really shining light onto our own sensitivity and preferences, and doing that together is a main theme of this experience, and I hope a main theme that I can help bring more to life in the world. Again, this being a very playful experience with no right answer, you leave it and you return your props and you see all of the different stories throughout time that have been associated with the flavor of the color purple. And so we start to see more and more how we construct meaning and make stories through our different sensory experiences. Now, I want to close with this and also be sensitive to time because um, this obviously, <laughs> in terms of our ability to have you know, robust human sensory experiences came to a great halt. And I think a point of inflection in culture only just a few short years ago as we all globally experienced you know, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and just at the beginning of COVID, I had um, you know, the great loss of losing all of this work. Um, nobody wanted to eat or lick in public, obviously, nor was that safe. But I also had the great privilege of being asked to pitch on um, kind of a once in a lifetime project for the Museum of the Future in Dubai. Uh, if you haven't seen that building, I'll show you an image of it um, shortly. It's a really iconic project. But the interesting thing about it is that it was looking at the future and still is of the future of humanity and our relationship to technology. How will technology affect the human experience? You know, at the time we were all, I think, sitting like this. This project came up in 2020. Um, and it really started to make me question, you know, what is the role of technology? Is it here to help us or to hurt us? Because as much as this is amazing, because we get to all be in the same space and, you know, I get to talk for a long time. <laughs> is it really delivering on the quality of human connection that makes our lives so rich and so meaningful? 
And so this project for me also became quite personal and, and incredibly relevant to the time and place, though it was supposed to be of the future. And I started to ask myself, how do we really start to create that sense of reconnection, not only to each other, but also to ourselves? The museum itself, this is it. It's one of the most iconic buildings in the world. Um, it was launched also within Dubai to elevate Dubai's role in you know, helping humanity aspirationally overcome its greatest challenges to create a hope for a brighter, more positive future. The floor that I was asked to pitch on was is the third floor of the Museum of the Future. And it was intended to be in response as an antidote to the potential destructive habits of our future digital life. You know, this is a dystopia that we see. What are the cracks? What is the light that we can shine on potential hope? And as a deep believer in story, this was interesting to me and meaningful for me because I wanted to participate in telling a different story, a story that wasn't based on optimization, speed, efficiency, or productivity, but instead a story that maybe was more of what we might call a female gaze outside of gender and body, but a gaze that would allow us to think of experiences of care, of well-being, of community, and again, of human connection. And so from that, Al-Waha was born, which in Arabic means the oasis. And it is very simply and very complexly a spa for the senses. So this flora was meant to engage people in experiencing how technology might start to enhance these kind of more qualitative human experiences and potentially bring us back to our bodies, back to our senses, back to each other. The approach here is that it was really a celebration of our human technology. Again, the power of our five senses. There was be to know no visible technology within the space, no screens, no buttons, no phones allowed, right? Along the premise narratively that all change for any of us must come from within. And so centering the human body really as the point of experience and transformation was primary here. The space itself is um, a semi, kind of an elliptical semicircle, as you saw from the building exterior, which is modeled after original classic geometries of care, like Roman baths, hammams, spaces that have collective points of gathering in the center, like pools, baths, where people go and they move and they gather together, you know, kind of the soft experiences that happen with that or being able to notice how different bodies age, how we might start to relate to each other, serendipitous encounters as well. Along that is flanked three different treatment rooms that each of them address a different quality that might be in peril in the future. So treatments that start to restore a sense of feeling, a sense of connection, and also that reground us in our bodies into the world. I also want to call out that this is impossible without smell-o-vision, but each of these experiences was actually custom scented. I had the great opportunity and privilege to work with Algorithmic Perfumery, who is a Netherlands-based studio that uses artificial intelligence and rapid prototyping technology to quickly iterate on scent design. And that, again, is a whole other <laughs> presentation in and of itself. But what this allowed us to do was to correlate emotional experience very quickly with different molecules that would allow us to test at a much faster space or pace, you know, what sense might enhance and create deeper immersion and continue to tell the story of care. So the museum going experience, just give a little bit of context, starts down here. You then go up either through an elevator or stairs all the way to a top fifth floor. And then you walk down three immersive floors, each of those floors sharing a different lens onto a relationship between technology and our human futures. The top floor being space travel, the second, the, I'm sorry, the fourth floor being an institute for climate change about how we might participate in remediating um, uh, our natural world through technology. And then the third floor, which is Alwaha, centers again around the human body and how technology can start to reconnect us again to self, to society, and to spirit. It's delined in this very skin tone palette from very light pinks to dark browns and offers a pretty curated guided entry that starts with a cleansing vapor fountain that's scented 
with notes of kefak tea, which are notes of cardamom and saffron, things that really create an emotion of hospitality that are also very localized. So I want to call this out too, because this is an interesting sensory choice. Upon walking into a spa, we might traditionally through a Western lens specifically think of cleansing scents like eucalyptus, right? Things that are fresh, enlivening. And this was a real choice. The choice here was to create an atmosphere of warmth, of tactility, to really further emphasize human connection and hospitality. And so scent can be used in this way, not just to create a mood, but also to kind of set the timber and the narrative context for such an experience. I'm going to fly th through these different treatments and touch on them lightly. Move, as I said, being the central treatment. This is a large scale um, projection map floor. The interesting thing about it, you can hear, hear also the sound design, which is here. louder. Okay. You can't hear me anymore. Can you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. This is the this is the somber part of the presentation, and I really screwed it up. <laughs> Hopefully, you saw that. Hopefully, you saw that happen. Um, let's go back to the still image of it here. As you can see in the center. Um, thank you, video. It's hard to hear. Thank you, Leo. Okay, I'm not going to talk while the video plays. Thanks, audiovisual team. So in the center here, you have a semicircle that it appears to extend into a whole circle through a floor to ceiling um, uh, mirror space. And I want to call out that I developed the original concept, all the creative direction, and saw this project through from beginning to end alongside Atelier Bruckner, who's a Stuttgart-based firm who did all of the um, interior design and sonography for actually the entire museum. Deep Local did all of the tangible design and technology and Polytope Studios based in LA did all of the audio sonography. Um, so this project could not have happened without any of those people. Thank you. This central space here is projection map real-time generative visuals that kind of mimic an ocean of air and an ocean of sand. When you walk through them, as you saw in that video, you start to get real-time responses that make you feel as though you're kicking through sand or air or water. So implying really a fluidity of movement. Tactily here also, the sense of touch is really important. Um, this is double padded carpet that this is projected onto. So when you step onto it, it's actually a real sense of softness. And as you heard in the audio piece as well, you're bathed in kind of a particle uh, sound that also serves at the noise floor for the entire space. Flanking that are a series of different treatments, ground being the central one on access to the floor, which is in response to the idea that as our urban digital futures grow, our electromagnetic field may suffer as we start to rise higher and higher in frequency. And so we will need treatments that really reground us back to our original human frequencies, 7.8 Hertz, as well as the earthly frequency. So this treatment is designed as an experience of standing between two gongs that actually are being excited invisibly through subwoofers. Um, this room is also scented in kind of a deep oud, which is a really sensual kind of incense space. And you stand between it and your entire body starts to get revibrated. The supporting treatment to the left of it is a treatment called Connect. This is based on a potential future where we start to have more and more isolation. How can we have treatments that allow us to connect together through our bodies? It's also based on the notion of universal connection through visual metaphors like constellations. And so 
This project, as you can see, asks a group of um, seven different participants to sit down around an elliptical table. And the interface here for interaction is voice. So within this railing, there are a series of microphones built into that. And as you hum, you generate a star path. So you're humming, your voice is translated into it. And if all of your stars get to the center, they connect as a constellation and you experience the healing powers of together. Now, again, within that piece, there's a lot to deconstruct. As you get the healing powers of togetherness, there's also embedded scent diffusion in the railing. So you get this smell of outer space that's also projected onto you. Um, and a lot of really nuanced, nuanced work. The last one that I want to share with you is this, the feel treatment. And this, I think, is one of the more novel experiences of it. It takes this premise that our hand is the instrument of the mind. Maria Montessori, the the child pedagogue originally said this, and it implies that our embodiment is a direct path road into our minds. And so taking into consideration how all of our clicking and tapping and swiping might start to desensitize our hands, this project explores how we might restore sensitivity to our palms as a means of restoring sensitivity to our minds. And so it presents a series of these individual booths underneath which ultra haptic technology is embedded. If you don't know what that is, they're ultrasonic transducers that when excited can be co-located to a three-dimensional program and create the illusion um, of touch. It's postulated as kind of the future of touchless interfaces. So you get the sensation that you're holding a ball or a cube, you know, it still is youthful in its development, I will say. But what it does, does deliver on this sense again of magic. And so the ultra haptics here were designed to be a very poetic experience, quite simply a tactile meditation that has binaural audio that's oscillating between each of your ears that neurologically we now know also has some very curative properties of being able to reprogram and create plasticity in the human brain. That's telling you to just slowly notice the changing sensations under your hands. This is completely undirected and it is up to the participant to make their own meaning and up to the participant to become more and more and more present with the sense of touch with feeling and that really is the point i think of a lot of this sort of work What I took away from this project, and I think what I take away from a lot of this experience, is that one of the profound affects of multisensory design is that what it does is it implicates us as full feeling beings, right? When you're doing multisensory design, you have to take into account the whole person. That I think is a lens that we can put onto all of our work and all of our creativity and maybe also all of our relationships, that we are here together not just as ideas or representations, but really as full people who are constantly experiencing a full spectra of different inputs and perceptions. Within that, if we take it as that that becomes kind of our design toolkit for crafting experience and crafting perception, I like to think of this duality, that if we are in the business here of making stories, you know, very simply the stories that we tell are the stories that we live as people. But I think there's a slight nuance in there when we start to think about multi-sensory design and kind of the future of what might become immersive is that really the stories that we feel are the people that we become. And there is a difference between living and being. 
right? There is an agency and an engagement with that, which I think really starts to have more and more implications as we move forward in this fraught world. I wanna leave you with this. Um, for the last 20 years of his life, my father was a high school photography teacher and he would make these zines with his student every month and he would mail them all around the world. <laughs> they were usually highly moralistic, uh, very DIY, and he would always end them on the back with some kind of little story about that theme. This was like one of his last ones that he made and it was about, it was called cell phony, uh, puns intended. And I wanna share it with you because it has a small story in here that's relevant to our work, is that there are inventions that change the course of human history. And once they appear, our existence is altered forever. You know, cell phones are certainly one of those inventions. And he said it was estimated that teenagers check their cell phones an average of 110 times a day. And so if for a teacher in a classroom, it's a constant problem. No different, I suppose, in parents trying to have a conversation at the dinner table with a teenager and a regular phone. When I was young, we had an elderly cousin who lived with us for a few years. She was born in 1877, 12 years after the Civil War ended. And when she was in her 90s, we would often count the inventions she had witnessed during her long life. Airplanes, electricity, running water, indoor plumbing, automobiles, radio, TV, phones, aspirin, penicillin, computers, and space travel. The list was long. As impressive as the list was, however, we never got the sense that the inventions distanced her life from ours. It's different today. Phones can be a shield, a barrier between people. For some reason, the thing in the pocket holds more interest than the person standing in front of us. I'll leave you with this. I think it's really interesting to be here. The end. Thank <laughs> you.